Welcome everyone to the very first Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture of the 2020-2021 academic year. Uh, my name is Arvind Draman, I'm the Executive Associate Dean for the Faculty and Staff here in the college. Uh, now, the Distinguished Lecture Series really started in 2018, uh, really to invite uh, world-renowned faculty and, and professionals uh, to Purdue Engineering to engage in thought-provoking conversations and ideas uh, with faculty and students regarding the grand challenges in their fields and opportunities there as well. Now, besides participating in an interactive panel, which just concluded, uh, you know, a, a few minutes ago, uh, the distinguished lecturers also present uh, a lecture to a broad audience of faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students as well. Um, today's uh, talk is going to be about cooling technologies for data centers, uh, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, as our Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecturer for today, uh, Professor Dereje Ogonifer, uh, who is the Presidential Distinguished Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the University of Texas at Arlington, where he heads two centers. He is the site director of an NSF IUCRC on energy efficient systems and director of electronic packaging. He, Dr. Uh, Gunnifer received his PhD at Howard University. And after that, he worked for 15 years at IBM. In 1990 work, in 1991, his work was recognized by being awarded the IBM Outstanding Technical Achievement Award in Appreciation of Computer-Aided Thermal Modeling. Uh, since joining UT Arlington in 1999, he has graduated 230 graduate students, a record for the university, record for any university, uh, including 25 PhDs and currently advises 16 PhDs and 13 master students. His former students are making significant contributions in many technology companies such as Facebook, Intel, 3M, Microsoft, and Amazon. His new initiative, which I think we'll be hearing about in his talk today, is to start a new center called RAMPS, Center for Reliability Assessment in Micro and Power Electronic Systems, for which he he's received significant funding, new equipment, and lab space and faculty lines as well to work with him. For his contributions, he's received many awards and I can only pick on a few. Uh, it'll take too much time to go through all of them. But he's been honored and recognized by the 2014 Nesby Golden Torch Award and the 2019 ASME Heat Transfer Memorial Award amongst others. Uh, in 2020, he was a recipient of Howard University's Charter Day Award for a Distinguished Postgraduate Achievement Research Engineer. In 2020, he received the Semi-Therm Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of significant contributions to the field of electronics thermal management. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, the National Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. In 2019, he was elected to the US National Academy of Engineering. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Agonifer uh, for his distinguished lecture. Over to you, Dereja. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Uh, I uh, had a great day today. I, I met uh, uh, many of my uh, colleagues. I started out, I think, a uh, meeting with uh, uh, Dr. Ganesh Subarayan, then uh, Dr. Sam Mudawar, people I've known for a long time, and then uh, Dr. Anil uh, Bajaj, the former department head, and uh, and my good friend, Dr. Jay Gore, and uh, another good friend, Dr. A.J. Malish, and, uh, uh, and then finally uh, was the um, uh, current acting dean, Dr. Mark uh, uh, Landstrom, who reminded me about, uh, uh, in thermodynamics, let's not just talk about efficiency, let's talk about uh, uh, entropy destruction or uh, uh, exergy, maximizing uh, the, uh, the total work. So let's let's look at it from an exergy point of view. So so that was, that was very nice. So today I'll talk about cooling technologies for data center challenges and opportunities. This uh, talk was preceded by a panel uh, where I had uh, my great friends, Dr. Ashish Gupta. Uh, oh, my video is not on. Let me turn it on. Dr. Ashish Gupta from. Uh, Intel and Dr. Madhu Ayangar from uh, Google and, and, and several uh, uh, colleagues I've met from Purdue. Uh, we talked about a little bit about data centers. 
So in particular, I'll talk a little bit about what are the challenges and opportunities. Uh, some of the stuff is really back to the future and some certainly new. So, Uh, outline will be uh, background, free cooling and evaporative cooling. You know, some might say you know, it's been around for a while, but yes, it's still extremely important. Uh, liquid cooling, uh, indirect liquid cooling using cold plates, immersion cooling. And what is the impact of new packaging technologies or in particular heterogeneous integration? How is that gonna impact uh, data center uh, thermal management and uh, reliability. So what is a data center? It's it really, it's a purpose-built infrastructure or facility that houses IT equipments, such as servers and storage. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, it can, uh, uh, you get, have access to data. And certainly we have uh, known how important it is and uh, no time has it been more important than uh, uh, during this pandemic currently where we are always clicking on our uh, phones to access data. And uh, no two, two facilities are the same. You can have facilities that are very small, like I have uh, two experimental data centers that are at 625 square feet each. And then uh, a few miles away, we have... Uh, 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 Facebook that has uh, 800,000 square foot uh, data center facility, a little bigger than ours. So what are the types of facilities and what are the shift in trends? So the Amazon, Google, Facebook, and so on, they have really fairly energy efficient, energy efficiency is important. They have what we call a hyperscale facility and this uh, purpose built and then you have uh, companies, uh, finance companies like Citigroup and, and Bank of America and others. Uh, and reliability is extremely important. You cannot fail. You want to have 99.999% availability, right? So that, that's critical. So it costs maybe not that much. Then we have uh, digital reality uh, uh, companies like, uh, uh, which are sell floor, floor space so that you can have uh, 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 computing. It's really a co-location facility. Now by 2025, it's predicted that uh, infrastructure hardware buyers like Google, Amazon, and so on, will consume 50% plus of all server and storage infrastructure deployed. So, and the growth of hyperscale enterprise facilities is very significant. I'll talk about it in a minute. So here's a microprocessor trend. So if you look at this, uh, first of all, if you look at the transistors, the number of transistors, this is Moore's law, continues to double. Now the frequency is a different story, right? It used to be in the early 60s every year, then two years, uh, maybe now every four to five years, but the number of transistors uh, for a given uh, area continues to double. Uh, now the performance, now when you look at a single thread though, not so much so, right? Starting to flatten out. And the frequency since roughly around 2004 or so has been fairly flat, probably between three to five gigahertz or so, and it, it, it continues to be that. And we reached the uh, typical, uh, 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 the uh, uh, thermal design power, it really started flattening up. The reason is that we have this thing called Denard scaling, which is really the physics behind Moore's law, which says that the power density it used to be the power density is the voltage times the current, right? It used to be, but it is, divided by the area. All of them scaled roughly towards the square root of 1.4, 0.7. But then the power stopped scaling, uh, or the voltage stopped scaling like that, more like 0.8 or so. Therefore, for a given footprint, the power density will start going up unless we 
limit the power. So that's really what has happened. There is really limiting, you can see here, uh, uh, limiting the typical power watts after 2004 or so. And then you can see the number of cores. How do you get performance? Then you increase the number of cores uh, significantly, right? Four, eight, 16, and so on and so forth, right? And, and uh, you also hear, uh, you look at the nodes. Uh, so uh, GPUs, uh, 7, 12, I know that uh, 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 companies like uh, uh, TSMC actually have gone uh, significantly lower, you know, five nanometer, and even talk about three nanometer. But when you start looking at that, the, uh, I need to move this out of the way. Uh, the, the issue there is that the cost, uh, if you look at the cost, uh, the, um, versus the previous technology after 2004 or so, this, the cost starts becoming significantly higher. So part of Moore's law, the one part of it is it doubles every two years or 18 months, whatever the case. And the other is the cost continues to get down. So you got freebie, the cost goes down of transistor and you're getting, uh, you're getting uh, 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 more transistors so you can do more work, but, but that's not the case anymore. So that's really something we have to pay attention to and discuss that more. And now energy demand and data centers, as you can see the energy demand, you know, continue to grow. Uh, and it was really, this was what was predicted in the 2010. Uh, this was what was predicted that the energy efficiency, uh, the, the annual uh, efficiency use, electricity use was gonna go significant ex exponentially high. But what happened was in the 2010 or so, there started to become, uh, you start uh, uh, using improved management, a uh, huge hyperscale shift between 2010 and 2018, and hyperscales sig significantly bring down the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, electricity use. So if you start looking at the combination of best practices, and hyperscale. So you really start having some leverage on what the electricity use is. So we have to continue doing that, but that's, that's, uh, that's uh, so this prediction is not necessarily, uh, if you look at some papers in, uh, in the early 2000, uh, it, was, it was doomsday, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in the thermal area have done a lot of good work uh, to, to, to reduce that. Now, uh, if you look at the, uh, in a pie chart, where the uh, electricity uses, significant electricity use in cooling, uh, storage and network and servers, but we really want to minimize this as much as you can, right? And if you start looking at the 2010, where the traditional data centers dominated and not so much so when you start looking at cloud and hyperscale versus uh, 2018, uh, the uh, significant increase in the hyperscale and, uh, and uh, as well as the cloud, uh, the efficiencies have improved significantly. And so this is just to show you again, uh, what the, uh, uh, the global energy storage used. This is 2010 to 2018. Uh, uh, installed storage capacity increased significantly. Everything is increasing, except we're doing a good job uh, related to PUE, for example, by 0.75. So energy efficiency has increased better energy efficiency, but the server demands continue to rise. So the path forward is we want to use the extend the historical energy efficiency gains, widespread adoption of innovative efficiency measures to maximize infrastructure efficiency, 
develop new technology to, to manage change landscape and better modeling capabilities for decision makers and open sharing of uh, reliable data at the global level. So now let me start talking about some of the cooling strategies. Uh, I'll start off by talking about free cooling. Free cooling is really, you have a data center, you just bring the outside air in and just uh, bring it into the server, not paying attention to what the temperature is or, or what the uh, relative humidity is. Obviously, if you're gonna do that 100% of the time, you gotta be in the right environment, right? Because the servers are set up such that from a reliability point of view, you got a zone, you got an envelope where the relative humidity and the dry bulb temperature got to be in that envelope. However, uh, you know, depending on where you are, you might 90% of the time, uh, you might be in that uh, envelope so you can do free cooling. And the rest of the time you can, you know, uh, get out of that area a little bit out of the free cooling. In other words, the dry bulb temperature and relative humidity can just, uh, go outside of the zone, it's okay, as long as it's for a limited, a limited amount of time. So evaporative cooling is large enterprises use that, but they then couple that evaporative, uh, I mean, uh, uh, free cooling. Uh, then if you wanna complement free cooling with evaporative cooling, what you do is you use spray and then subsequently uh, cooling medias where you use the latent heat of uh, vaporization to significantly uh, reduce the need for uh, uh, really uh, compressors, right? The need, the need for uh, cry, uh, cry units, computer room, air handling units. So the cooling equipment suppliers provide often large indirect evaporative. The indirect evaporative, the nice thing about that is, um, uh, in the in the panel, you might have met, uh, heard uh, uh, the the panelists talk about uh, uh, the that that we're going to have some contamination. So if you just bring the outside air without doing anything, you can have contamination issue. You know where you can have uh, some of the uh, uh, copper and uh, and silver and so on and so forth can uh, can be oxidized, uh, subsequently leading to some reliability issues. So you have to be concerned about that, but with indirect, you don't have to do that because the, the, the air that's being cooled is not, uh, uh, is not uh, in touch with the outside environment at all. So here is a typical direct uh, evaporative uh, cooling. So, so you have, uh, uh, you bring the outside air and potentially you might mix the, you might mix it, this, this could be, Cold, for example, if so, you know, you, you can mix it with the exhaust, with the hot eye. And, uh, and then you have a filter wall, misting system. So you use this uh, direct uh, latent heat of vaporization to cool it and then supply that cold air, right? And this is a typical misting system that's being used at, uh, that was used at uh, Facebook, eventually this led to, uh, uh, cooling medias. And yes, so this is uh, uh, a, a rigid media versus what you just saw the misting where you have this cooling media where water flows in the cooling media and the air blows through it and then you have a, a latent heat. So the challenge and opportunities are uh, that uh, uh, for end user operator, uh, you know, you you got to be able to say, at, when, am I, when am I going to be concerned? You have to have control. When am I be going to be concerned that those servers are meeting the, uh, the, the uh, uh, criterion, for example, if it's being sold by Dell or, or IBM and so on, that the air that's coming in, the air and the relative humidity and dry bulb temperature is in that recommended zone. How do I do that? Uh, so uh, there is widespread adoption, evaporative cooling, air side economization provide immense potential for continued energy uh, uh, saving and it's being used extensively. So 
the outline of some of the work, we've done extensive amount of work in this area is direct and indirect evaporative cooling. A key thing there is really the cooling media. How do you characterize the cooling media? How do you optimize it? You split the cooling media vertically, horizontally. It's a lot of experiment that needs to be done uh, to do that kind of stuff. So uh, this is uh, funded by uh, uh, National Science Foundation. And in this particular case, uh, the, we're collaborating with uh, Binghamton University, Bagat Samakea, colleague of mine, and the industry that sponsors it. Obviously, this is funded by NSF and uh, uh, Facebook, Future Facilities, and Mestex. Uh, this is direct and in, indirect evaporative cooling of IT parts. So here is a, a psychometric chart. So a psychometric chart it really is a, a two-dimensional state of uh, 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 moist air, really. So uh, in other words, you assume that there is a third property, right? If you use Gibbs phase rule, you need three thermodynamic properties. But once you fix one, you need two. So here is a 2011 of the psychometric chart. What that's saying is, if you are in this recommended zone, if the air that's coming in somehow into the servers are in this recommended zone, you're good. But then uh, in order to save efficiency, this was between 18 and 27 degrees C. I mean, that's, that's pretty tight. You know, uh, data center operators say, look, we need better stuff than that. You know, IBM, uh, Dale, and so on. Can you provide us equipment where we can really raise the inlet temperature? And so. Uh, that was done. So right now you can have uh, uh, this envelope here. Uh, this is allowable zone where the inlet temperature can be up to 45 degrees. Not necessarily the entire time, but it will allow you to bring in air up to 45 degrees C. So which means uh, almost no need uh, most of the time for uh, uh, any uh, mechanical cooling. And uh, uh, subsequently, what's happened, if you look at the difference between this is uh, you have been able to reduce the uh, relative humidity significantly to about 8%, right? So, so this is something that we follow. Uh, one is in uh, uh, British units and the other one is that. So this is more uh, the thermal guidelines, again, uh, supply was a copy of this. So the goal of this project is to provide best practice for using direct evaporative cooling and indirect evaporative cooling techniques, develop deeper insight and provide unbiased guidance in implementing, operating and maintaining evaporative cooling system. Keep in mind that uh, a huge percentage uh, uh, of the installation still uh, uses uh, direct and indirect evaporative uh, heat exchanger, we talked a little bit about, so it's still to a certain extent liquid, right? Because we have evaporation, but, uh, uh, but when we say we're gonna try to migrate to uh, direct liquid cooling, uh, like um, cold plates and so on, uh, it does not mean we're gonna make that migration right away. It's gonna take some time, but we're, uh, we're being pushed to do that. So here's some of the tests we've done a lot of work on uh, the uh, cooling media and uh, the indirect evaporative cooling uh, as such. So we actually building, uh, talk about uh, making a, a unique uh, heat exchanger. Uh, so this is air side economization. So if you're, if you look at this, uh, if you are anywhere in this region, you can do uh, eva direct evaporative cooling right? If you are, uh, you know, this is the recommended zone. So if you happen to be, if the outside air uh, happens to have a dry bulb temperature and relative humidity anywhere here, you can do direct evaporative cooling and be able to get into the recommended zone. Uh, if you are somewhere over here, you need to do um, indirect cooling, right? To get anywhere in here, uh, or you can go all the way down here, or you can do it in two steps. You can get anywhere to this point and then do a direct evaporative cooling. Right, in this particular case, for example, you cool 
you reach somewhere in this zone and then you can do direct evaporative cooling. So uh, a lot of work needed to be done. So we teamed up with a company called Mestex uh, who are our sponsors and they've been sponsoring our work for several years. So we wanna thank them. In fact, as we were speaking, we probably had a meeting with them today. So we built this uh, IT pod. Uh, this is where electronics is. And we have a cooling tower. We have a, a, a cooling media, a media for direct evaporative cooling and indirect uh, as well as uh, indirect evaporative cooling. So this, we've been running this for about five years and with very little reliability issues. So uh, evaporate efficiency versus maintenance. So we've been doing a lot of work related to this. Once again, the cooling media is critical. How do you split it, you know, vertically, horizontally? And, uh, and then also, how do you control the inlet? Uh, doing, we use uh, for this data center computation, we use something, uh, a program called Six Sigma by Future Facilities, a company we work very closely with. But in addition, we're also developing neural networks. So we're actually using this, uh, this uh, uh, IT pod, we have developed tremendous amount of data so that we can develop an artificial neural network so we can have on-time modeling or in-situ modeling so we can control the inlet and outlet conditions, uh, the inlet condition uh, with evaporator. And this is how we test the evaporative cooling media. You know, we have uh, uh, this wireless uh, relative uh, humidity and drive up temperature and so on. And then uh, we are currently uh, working with uh, a company called Comscope, uh, where we're looking at uh, free cooling uh, for their 5G towers. And uh, they're a very good customer of ours. They've been participating in our work since day one, since 2011. So uh, this is some of the work. I can't go into too much detail about it, but some of the work we're doing. And there's proactive control and scheduling of data center coding using a neural network. Like I told you, we developed this neural network uh, using the test data we have. You know, we do CFD and then we create this artificial neural network model. And again, this is the uh, CFD model using our uh, uh, test uh, data center. And uh, I won't go into too much of the details about uh, the models we create, but uh, uh, so the summary and future work is uh, CFD simulation based training. Uh, the CFD simulation takes quite a bit of time, but it's fairly accurate. That then guide us to develop this NN models. And the results showed that predictive data driven models have huge potential in optimizing uh, sequence operations. And the future work, we're gonna look at determining the subset of input conditions uh, and uh, to build a training data, uh, uh, data set using CFD simulations. This is the outside air temperature patterns. And then uh, uh, another thing is the development of heat exchangers. This is very important. So we're, uh, it's a project uh, one of my PhD students is involved in, uh, Ashwin Siddharth, with a couple of master's students, uh, and uh, Vibin is a PhD student, and we're collaborating with, uh, again, Bagas Samakia from uh, Binghamton. Uh, so this is the experimental testing to investigate the change in effectiveness of an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, which we're actually building, and to develop a compact model. So this is the indirect air side economizer unit. And uh, this is the uh, commissioning is uh, currently in progress. And the summary is a comprehensive guide to promote widespread adaption of direct and indirect evaporative cooling implemented with air side economization, better modeling for proactive control strategies and design and commissioning of direct and indirect evaporative heat exchanger and air handling units. Now, liquid cooling, 
uh, one of my students here, Ushas, uh, he's currently uh, doing some uh, internship with uh, NVIDIA. Uh, this is some of the work he did uh, with uh, uh, Cisco servers. This is really a hybrid uh, direct and indirect, uh, I mean, uh, hybrid air and liquid cooled systems. So when you look at the hierarchy of cooling solutions, you have single phase, uh, Google, IBM, Lenovo. Keep in mind, IBM been doing uh, liquid cooling forever, right, since the early 80s. And uh, in fact, they have been doing 100% liquid cooling of uh, racks in the order of 200 uh, kilowatts and more. So uh, when people start saying, I'm concerned about water, uh, certainly IBM been doing this work forever. Uh, Lenovo, this is a Lenovo system, uh, Baidu, NVIDIA, and uh, uh, this is the open computer uh, project. And then you have two phase, Norel, IBM, and NVIDIA as well. So this is some of the work uh, we've done. This is a Cisco uh, server, which is high, hybrid cool. It's uh, indirect liquid cooling with a cold plate as well as uh, fans. We actually use fans to cool some of the other systems. We really were able to improve the efficiency significantly. We were able to uh, show that uh, we can reduce the uh, number of fans by about 40%. It was really, the system was put together, but not really, not with the optimization in mind. And uh, we've also uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, this is a, a system uh, we got in collaboration with Facebook, uh, looking at uh, uh, centralized versus distributed uh, uh, cooling systems. And so uh, we looked at that and uh, was able to show that uh, with uh, uh, centralized <coughs> cooling system, uh, where we uh, perform significantly better. So this is uh, work was done by Manasseh Sahini. She's now got her PhD, she's now with Intel. And uh, this is the work, uh, 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 benchtop work done by, uh, by uh, 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 this is the uh, liquid cooling work. Uh, 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 this is a, a hybrid cool server. And uh, once again, I think I've already said that uh, we're able to show significant reductions in, uh, in, uh, in power in using the systems. Uh, this is comparative study in air and liquid cooling. Uh, so this is the work again done by uh, one of my students, Ushas. Uh, the publications are there if you're interested. And uh, the, uh, the future work is going to be uh, instead of just looking at the a single server, we actually received a donation by, by Cisco of an entire rack of uh, liquid cool rack with some like 38 servers. And so we're going to look at the uh, optimization for at the rack level. This is something that uh, Ushas is currently working on. Dynamic liquid cooling. As I said earlier, when we start looking at uh, uh, multi-core, so you start having multi-core systems, then you really start looking at non-uniformity in power distribution, which could also lead to non-uniformity in temperature, right? It will lead to that. And so that is really an issue because uh, from a cooling point of view, you want to cool for the worst case, the highest temperature. So what we have developed here at UTA is a cold plate we call a dynamic cold plate, right? This is being led by one of my students, Pradeep Shahi currently. And so what a dynamic cold plate can be used, uh, dynamic uh, cooling can be used both at the rack level as well as at the chip level. So I'll discuss both. So at the rack level, what we do is we have a flow control device where, and you have, you sense the temperature and based on the uh, temperature, we control the flow uh, so that 
uh, you really reduce the, you don't have to have, you don't look at the maximum temperature and have the same flow for each one of the servers. This, this is sort of simulating the rack. You can actually reduce the amount of flow going into this rack significantly. So this is rack level. The control strategy developed <clears throat> to control the pump based on uh, either pressure drop, right? Uh, so here's the control strategy. This is temperature based or temperature or pressure based. And, and then we have a, a active flow control device uh, that, uh, that opens up, you know, this is basically con uh, controls the resistance, right? If it's, if it's open, we have very little resistance, right? And you can, so it goes from zero to 90 degrees, right? FCD is divided broadly into three parts. Right? And, and this is the fabrication of it. And we are very, very conscious uh, when uh, Madhu earlier talked about the uh, uh, TCO, uh, uh, cost is always an option. So one of the things I told my students is, uh, that it, it has to cost less than a dollar to fabricate. And we, the FCD is currently less than a dollar. And this is the flow rates for different flow rates. I mean, the, this is the flow rate versus the angle. So we can actually control. Uh, so you can see that uh, based on the angle, if I'm at uh, 4 LPM, for example, I can change the angle and control how much flow it goes to this uh, FCD device, All right? And so using this FCD and dynamic cooling, we're able to show a 64% uh, pumping power uh, saving. And uh, this is the uh, schematic representation of the experiment that set up. In fact, one of the master students just uh, defended a couple of days ago in this particular work. And this is his final experimental setup, set up at the rack level. And uh, this is the single uh, uh, thermal test vehicle assembly. And then we show, you can see here that, uh, you know, the flow rate is the same, right? Experimental percent flow rate change, it's all the same versus as we start experiment two, we change the flow rate, right? And you can see that the temperature uh, uh, changes accordingly, right? So uh, what we are able to show is that, I'll just go to the conclusion on this, that the design and development of the novel FCD was 3D manufacturing that cost less than a dollar and we're able to reduce the pumping power by 64%. And this is rack level work. We plan to uh, uh, implement this uh, at the data center level as well. And now this is at the chip level. So at the chip level now, uh, you have uh, a microprocessor, GPU, whatever it is, has non-uniform power distribution. So what we're doing is, instead of just having a co-plate with serpentine channels where it is, flow just comes into one side and just turns around and goes out the other way or, or micro channels. We divide it up into a number of segments, uh, you know, four segments, for example. And depending on the temperature, we check the temperature right at the cold plate level. We have, we divide it in this particular case is divided into four. We check the temperature and then change the flow rate going into the different sections. This is what we call dynamic co-plate at the chip level. Uh, so, you know, this has been designed, the final design uh, used uh, bimetallic bi strips. And uh, uh, it, uh, it works really well. A lot of work, I, I know Pardeep is probably watching this and say you showed, you went through all this work I did in 20 seconds. Uh, and yes, that's what we do. But here's the punchline. So you can see this is a normal co-plate right, without the, uh, uh, without the uh, dynamic uh, uh, co-plate. And this is dynamic co-plate. So in this dynamic co-plate, you're able to reduce the 
delta T across uh, to 6.93 uh, uh, degrees C versus 15 degrees C here uh, without the dynamic cold plate. And, and, and furthermore, the maximum temperature here is 39 degrees versus 44. So future work is implementation of the novel flow control device at a rack level with controlled strategy for pumping power savings, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not just the, uh, the thermal resistance, but it's really a product of the pressure drop and, uh, and uh, flow rate, uh, the pumping power that we have to be concerned about. And the integration of the dynamic cold plate uh, and dynamic uh, cooling at the rack level, right? So I, I both the chip. So you want to integrate both of the chip and rack level, thus gaining even more significant. So, so immersion cooling. Uh, immersion cooling, so we have this rising power densities again, CPU and GPU. Uh, so I have talked about it already, uh, Denar scaling, need to increase power usage effectiveness. The power usage effectiveness is the total power uh, that you use. This is the IT power plus every, all the other power, you know, like for cooling and so on and so forth, divided by IT power. You really want it to be one because you, the only power you want to supply is just to the, uh, to the IT, but, uh, but that's not really the case. So, uh, we'll talk. so here is the computational demands, you know, GPU uh, versus uh, uh, CPU. Uh, thermal design trends, I, I have something like 400. Some people, uh, I know I heard uh, Ravi's talk uh, recently for iTerm, uh, the numbers 400, but these numbers are all very difficult to get out of industry, right? So just say, I heard, so that's good enough. Uh, and, and then we have high power applications and typical applications, ambient. So the cooling efficiency, so you're, you're looking at uh, cooling becoming a very significant power percentage of the overall uh, energy, while you really just want to focus just on the server, right? And the average PUE is <laughs> pretty up there. This is the worst case, and the average is something like 1.8 or 1.9, right? Again, the PUE I define as the total power, this IT power plus the cooling and everything else divided by the IT power. So, and the heat transfer limitations of different cooling technologies, right? You know, you have air cooling, force convection, and, uh, and then you have uh, dielectric uh, liquid. Uh, I, I'm sure if, uh, Professor Mudawar is in the audience, he probably will challenge me because he's, he's got some crazy numbers all the time, continues to do that. Uh, water, forced convection, uh, and uh, water boiling, and, uh, and uh, this is the spray cooling and so on. And this is water spray cooling. So this is some of the uh, limitations, heat transfer limitations. And these are some of the major players using immersion cooling. So immersion cooling, you have uh, IT equipment, you have liquid, uh, you, you have this inert liquid and you have a heat exchanger, right? CDU and you had a, a cooling tower uh, to, to, take, to take the heat load out. And so, and there's also two phase uh, immersion cooling as well. Uh, you know, the high power CPUs, obviously, if you can, you want to use two-phase. Two uh, some say it may be a little bit more complicated, but there's a lot of work in that particular area as well. So again, GPU versus CPU trend. So this is some of the issues uh, that some of the advantages of having uh, uh, immersion cooling. You can see that if you use, in case of loose a loss of cooling fluid, you only got just a little time before you, you start burning some chips, right? You start having some serious problems, you know, all the fans will stop. Here though, uh, you have significantly more time, about 30 minutes. And the noise level is also, right, significantly uh, reduced, right? You're talking about very low 
flow rates, you know, a few LPMs versus here you can have air cooling could be significant. And the reliability, you know, liquid versus that, right? Liquid protects IT devices from harsh environments. So we we're talking earlier was uh, Carol mentioned about some of the contamination stuff. We don't have to be concerned about that, even though there's some reliability issues here. So challenge and opportunities, uh, fluid selection is important and coolant material compatibility. This is very, very important. In fact, you can get some excellent performance heat transfer wise, but the, uh, but the reliability is, is certainly a concern. And uh, current and potential markets. So some of our research we have, this is work done by uh, uh, one of my former students, uh, uh, Rick Island and his colleagues, John Fernandez and so on now. Rick is at Dell and has a PhD. And this is looking at uh, immersion cooling uh, using uh, uh, oil. Uh, and uh, uh, we were able to go all the way to almost 50 degrees C. And keep in mind, one of the advantages if you have a flow, actually the properties is, is really gets better because the dynamic viscosity and uh, uh, starts uh, actually decreasing as you start going. So the, uh, so the pumping power actually decreases as the, you increase the temperature. So there's actually some advantages of going to high temperature. And uh, so we did some work for the, this was for open compute uh, server. Uh, it's called uh, Winterfell server from uh, Facebook. And this is, uh, we also tested for a company called LCS, uh, a rugged server. Uh, it's a lot of reliability work, you know, several hours in environmental chambers to, to see what happens if we start raising the inlet temperature. Uh, and so obviously we can control that using an uh, in, uh, environmental chamber. Uh, material compatibility, uh, we, we do a lot of testing. Uh, again, uh, this is not a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work, but uh, uh, this is what's really the bottleneck right now. If you're interested in doing immersion cooling or if you, if you ask a company why you're not adapting that, they're going to say reliability. And uh, usually it's uh, material compatibility. Uh, interestingly, that was also an issue way back uh, in IBM when uh, IBM came up with a liquid encapsulated module, the FC72, there were some issues related to materials. And that was really why we migrated to a liquid cooling uh, coal plate. Uh, so this is a lot of the work we've done in uh, uh, reliability testing. Uh, you know, dust and particulates, uh, the solar balls, uh, uh, we had to uh, uh, really cross section uh, to see what happens to the interconnects. And uh, we have done a lot of experimental CFD analysis of uh, uh, one use servers. Uh, one of the advantages because of the uh, fin efficiencies of liquid, right? You don't really need those uh, tall heat sinks, right? So you can go from a two use server to a one use server, which means you can almost double or certain, go up at least one and a half times the number of servers you have for a particular square footage. So this is really immersion cooling has a loss of advantage. Plus you now don't need to worry about a lot of space between the racks, right? Cause you don't need to have uh, 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 perforated tiles and so on and so forth. And uh, this is the form factor study that we did. Uh, and I, uh, then there's also, uh, again, minimum extinguishing uh, uh, concentration, uh, right? Fire hazards. I'll just pass by that. And there's a future work in that. Uh, I'll just quickly say maybe about two minutes. The heterogeneous integrated circuit thermal challenge and reliability. Uh, here's... Uh, the performance, uh, this is actually from John Hennessy, used to be the president of uh, Stanford University. 
and look at what's happening to performance, right? Starting to flatten out, right? And so how do you gain performance? Uh, and so, and Moore's law, you can see that the time between technology nodes is take more time, right? This is actually from uh, 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 Dr. Sue, the CEO of AMD. She presented this uh, a couple of years ago at ERI in Detroit. Uh, cost is also an issue. So this is a heterogeneous integration. This is now you have, uh, you know, an SOC type of device where everything is uh, together. But now you uh, say, look, I'm now going to have a, a heterogeneous integration where I'm going to have a particular node at 28 nanometers. I might have this node at 10 nanometers, right? You can't do this. You got to have all the silicon here got to be in the same technology node. So you can do the optimization. You can optimize for what you want to do. So uh, you can do this uh, on a, a silicon substrate or, uh, or you can use uh, MEB, uh, uh, Intel's uh, uh, equivalent of that uh, two and a half D. And you can also do 3D, but as you start going to 3D issue, it becomes very challenging. Uh, uh, in terms, especially in terms of cooling, because some of the heat from uh, this device is depending where the uh, ultimate heat sink is, is going to have some issues. How does it get out? In fact, we have a patent I, uh, with one of my students, uh, uh, how to use thermoelectrics and 3D cooling for uh, 3D packaging. So this uh, slide was two slides I got from uh, uh, Ravi Maharaj, and I called him and make sure I could use it. He actually sent me his presentation, his recent award presentation. So this is the integration. This is uh, what we call uh, a heterogeneous integration. So you, uh, you put the various optimized IPs on uh, and then, and then uh, uh, stitch them using different technologies. In this case, it's Intel, it's MF technology. And, and then, uh, here was sort of, uh, for some of you young guys, well, this was uh, the message he left us was, this was only a couple of weeks ago, or two, three weeks ago, I forget, uh, at iTherm, he, he gave that uh, keynote. Uh, he said, we need better team materials, right? So we need a 10X reduction you know, for the next decade. Extremely important. So I'm sure Carol is paying attention to that. You know, so I could do that. Uh, so, uh, dual purpose TIMs as wire pitch controls uh, uh, solutions, right? So it's not just uh, the TIM material. The TIM material, we also got to be dealing with wire pitch. I think also, I keep talking about Cal, she talked about that big uh, SOC device, so whatever that device was, and that uh, wire pitch associated with it. So that's, a, that's an issue. So it's not just thermal, it's thermomechanical and material, right? And research in liquid cooling, including immersion. So I talked about that. And I can tell you the immersion, it's not just heat transfer, it's reliability. New materials and cooling technologies to improve heat conduction, improve methodologies and increase focus on transient responses. And then co-design, co-design, I, I, I know it's about the end of the lecture, maybe a minute or so, but I wanna give credit to, I wanna, uh, a good friend of mine who recently passed away, Mike Ellsworth. Uh, he was he was a young guy, I used to mentor, but he, I, I can tell you guys, he had over 200 patents. So he was a liquid cooling guru. And then uh, someone that everyone knows, Avi Barcon, who recently passed away. He was he was really big on co-design, you know, both at DARPA and at DARPA and so on and so forth. He, uh, I mean, at DARPA, he pushed a lot. Co-design is really, uh, it used to be thermal people would be worried, hey, you're pushing us downstream. You want to be in the upstream phase of design, right? So that you can have material proper, material people, architecture, and everyone looking together uh, to talk about uh, uh, design upfront, right? That's what we call co-design. In fact, a lot of codes nowadays allow for co-design uh, programs like ANSYS and so on and so forth. So, uh, that I have a center, I'm forming a center called Rampus. I, I, 
I only want to say that it's uh, for heterogeneous thermal and reliability issues related to heterogeneous integration systems. And this is, I just showed a couple of, this is a recent, a couple of years ago. A lot of them are now going. Uh, Jamil now got his PhD, he's now at uh, uh, 3M. Uh, he's at, uh, got his PhD, he's now at uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, Abel Mizrak, uh, just finished, uh, got his PhD at Tesla, and he got his PhD, he's now a postdoc with me, and so on and so forth. So uh, the people go. And this is an older picture. When we go to uh, Silicon Valley, I, for some reason, I'm biased to Ethiopian restaurants. So this is at an Ethiopian restaurant. Some of it, John Fernandez, there, there it is from Facebook, he's a PhD, uh, and so on and so forth. And one of my great students currently, you will be finishing up soon, uh, Ashwin Siddharth here. Okay, I'll stop here. Sorry. Thank you so much, Jurejik. A very, very exciting talk. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, I'm going to start down the line here. Sure. Uh, and for the rest of you who are on the call, please feel free to add any questions uh, at this point. Uh, so the first question uh, is really uh, regarding uh, the potential and opportunities for immersion cooling technologies. Actually, that question was posted just prior to your slides on immersion cooling. So I think you may have addressed some of those things, but the question is a sort of a broad-based SWOT. If you were to do a SWOT today of strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, threats of immersion cooling technologies, what would your words of advice be? Reliability, and I can tell you it has a lot of, and I, it would be good to ask uh, uh, Dr. Ashish Gupta from Intel as well as Dr. Madhua Yanka while they're there. But a lot of opportunities, especially when you start looking at uh, uh, future packaging, because packaging is going to dictate cooling technology. So immersion cooling got lots of opportunities, but reliability is what's, that's a factor. I mean, we've done the cooling part and we're spending a lot of time looking at reliability at both the active, passive devices, you know, so on and so forth. So yes, it's reliability. Great, thank you. That question was from WGT Energy. Uh, a second question is oh, from- Oh, good friend, yeah. Uh, Adam Lema Demisi. Um, the question is, as demand for data centers is anticipated to grow rather fast in the coming years, is there any consideration for waste heat recovery uh, from a liquid medium uh, by way of expansion to generate power to feed back to data centers? Uh, uh, or the grid. Yeah, I, it, I'll quickly answer that there's a lot of work uh, in that, especially in Europe where it's conducive to that. We talked about it a little bit uh, during, during the panel discussion, but a lot of work, including my group, asked that individual to send me an email because I don't want to get started on that and I'll-, I'll uh, Sounds good. So it could be, it could be a long discussion. No, that's yeah. great. Um, I do want to uh, give the opportunity uh, to uh, those who you mentioned in your talk who are actually attending today to have a chance to, because you mentioned their names, to go back and ask questions. Uh, I'm going to see if Ashish is still on the call. Yes. Uh, yes. If you want to ask a question, uh, I think you uh, uh, you spoke about um, uh, Isamu Dawar's group. So if Isamu is on the call, please uh, feel free to. Jump yeah, in. yeah, I would love to hear his sound. Yes, Carol, I, I want to know what kind of heat flux he got. <laughs> so, was, uh, uh, but he did tell me he's starting to migrate now more into uh, aerospace applications. But I would like to see what he says. So you know, we have Ashish is actually on the on the panelists. If Ashish or Carol, yes. if you'd like to ask any questions, you know, feel free to uh, yes. jump in. Yeah, I think one question on immersion uh, is. Uh, what would you like uh, industry to do? Like what kind of relationship between the industry and academia should exist in the next coming years related to immersion? Uh, I think that, uh, that I, I, I think I try to make a case that immersion cooling is really important, especially uh, I don't need to, to lecture you on uh, uh, device trends, right? That th 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 there's a, uh, I think migrating to immersion is probably easier maybe even than uh, uh, some of the other cooling technologies. But what we need to do is really, we need to put students in, uh, a, 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 at work 
in the, in the labs, looking at reliability issues so that uh, there's this prejudice does not exist. Uh, there's no question in my mind. I mean, I did mention to you that we work with LCS and we uh, uh, work with other companies as well uh, currently uh, looking at reliability. So re reliability issues. And also I want to mention Ashish that uh, a few years ago, a couple of decades ago, right? You know, the, you have the IBM Research Lab and, and uh, Bell Labs and so on and so forth, right? Those things now uh, are changing. It become cost centers, and so uh, industry academia is now expected to go to to uh, uh, TRL two, three, and so on and so forth. So if that's the case, funding should be not for two, three years, but a little bit more. Uh, I think that I think that a long term, like a four year plan, and so on and so forth, would, would be really great. I know this. There's this thing about that's fun for three years because your PhD students finish up in three years, but you really need a longer term uh, so that people can build this, you know, space is a premium, right? And uh, like right now, Ashisha, we're, we're working on uh, liquid cooling, significant amount of uh, uh, money just to look at that uh, but then the space is limited and therefore we want to be able to leverage that. So uh, I think it will be good for, for, for industry to come in and say, look, uh, here's some of our challenge in the future. Uh, the money that I always tell uh, industry, people like you, that uh, we'll give you three times as much you'll give us. If not, don't come to us. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so fund us. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks, Ashish. Uh, I don't know if Carol wanted to yes. add. A yes, I do have a question. Thank you very much. So, um, Dorje, in, in the earlier discussion and in your presentation, you talked about all the vast amount of collaboration that has to happen, you know, starting with undergraduates, graduate students with uh, professionals. How would you like to see the community of universities start collaborating better together yeah. and more effectively together so that we can, I don't know, it, it will be more fun, but I think we'll also do, do a better job. I, I, Carol, you, your point is so well taken. I think we should all ch check our egos at the door. For example, to, to just listen to you on this panel, which is so great. All the stuff you bring about material issues, right? Uh, if it, you know, I have to be born again to pick up some of the knowledge base that you have, but we can, you know, get together and quickly that, you know, uh, get someone like, uh, you know, people like Madhu and Ashish and so on, have a panel discussion about how we can, I know the NSF does IUCRCs and other things or ERCs, but in addition to that, I think industry should be involved uh, and in saying, let us set a direction. We want packaging, we want materials, all of this uh, involved. And we like all of you universities to work together, right? Uh, I, I, I think it's a great idea that, that you just cannot do it by yourself. Uh, right. And a lot of times right. we are forced to do it by ourselves because I think sometimes the ego issue. So I, I certainly would love to work with you. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and Great. We'll find I look it forward to it. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks, Carol. We have one more question from Amaria Bay. Uh, thank you. Uh, from your experience, which commercial software is easy and recommended for CFD data center cooling analysis? Are you kidding me? You think I'll answer something like that? <laughs> so here's the answer. I like them all. All right. But we use ANSYS, Icepack, uh, you know, Fluent, we use Future Facility, Six Sigma, we use Flowtherm. And if you ask me to rank them, I rank them all A plus. Let me tell you something. Otherwise, as soon as I get off this, I, I happen to be a preferred uh, kind of customer. So they do a lot of things for us. You know, the last thing I want is for my students to call me and say, you know, after that uh, panel, your, uh, your li our license was suspended, you know? So I will never answer that question. Sorry. <laughs> um, Dorije, on that, while I wait for, we have time for maybe just a, a couple of more questions, but um, 
while we're waiting for that, I had a question which kind of maybe tease off a little bit on the uh, computational side. Um, you know, with the increase in logic cores and transistors that you showed, um, you know, the challenge that you brought up is really with this increase in energy density uh, and heat flux, right? Uh, the cooling capacity has to catch up, stay up with all those increases, right? And PUE has to keep coming down. So broadly speaking, as you see this gap between sort of increasing uh, needs for cooling capacity um, uh, and the need for the cooling systems to catch up, right? That gap, uh, you know, how does it, how do you close the gap? I, I, I learned from your talk that there are two big places where the gap can be closed. One is your own um, modus, operandi, uh, modus operandi, if you will, seems to be driven by computational predictive models as really showing the pathway forward is the enabler in, in a way data being used <laughs> to improve uh, you know cooling yes. of the centers yeah. uh, kind of a closed loop in that sense um, you also brought up you know an issue of uh, reliability over and over again right so th there's there's that last mile reliability is really the last mile of you know great ideas are there but they haven't made it really to, because of reliability issue so besides this idea of computational predictive models and reliability as you know you know these these could help address the gap that exists what else uh, is there really uh, where, where can we squeeze more of this gap away and you know approach what's needed in the coming years yeah a, a, a good point i interestingly i had uh, uh, a meeting with your acting dean well, mark langstrom he said, why are we talking about, uh, uh, you know, just uh, the efficiency? We need to talk about uh, uh, exergy-based efficiencies or uh, interchangeably entropy destruction. That's one thing to talk about. But I think that we need to know where the technology is going. You did see where the frequency between technology nodes increasing, right? In the meantime, you got to get performance, right? So what's going to dictate that is, is packaging is going to be dictating that. And therefore it's people like, uh, 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 you know, Ashish Gupta, Madhua, Yangar and so on to tell us when are you going to start migrating to this thing? Cause you don't want to get caught uh, by surprise. Cause this is going to happen. For example, we've been talking about liquid cooling for a long, long time, right? But liquid cooling being implemented, but very, very narrow, right? And so I think at the academic level, we need to anticipate uh, technology direction, which if I tell you it's gonna take five years for the next technology, I mean, Intel is now dealing with 10 nanometers now and for a little while, right? As well, right? And so, but they are looking at very exciting technology like Lakefield and Foveros. Foveros is the packaging, right? This, it's, are we, are you guys prepared to look at those kind of trends uh, to, to, to be able to look at? That's really where the academia can come in. I don't think academia is looking that far uh, from that point of view. Not, not everyone at least. Very good. Yeah. Uh, but so, so you should tap and you should uh, uh, call Ashish a little bit more frequently. Yep, yep. That's great. Uh, Dereji, I think, uh, I think we're at time here. We've actually gone 10 minutes over uh, you know, on behalf certainly of the School of Mechanical Engineering that's uh, uh, sponsoring uh, uh, the distinguished lecture today uh, and the College of Engineering. We'd like to really thank you for spending the day with us uh, in such uh, difficult and uh, abnormal circumstances uh, and uh, you know, really enlightening us with all your wisdom and uh, in describing all the great uh, research opportunities and the grand challenges in this space. So thank you everyone. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and uh, the recording of this uh, talk is going to be available uh, on the Distinguished Lecture website, uh, as well as the panel. So uh, thank you everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Arvind. See you.